uh, I'm excited to have you on. First of all, we've never had you on the show before. It was fun to have you on. But the thing that I'm really excited about is you're a super smart guy. So we had Ali Shakur on the other day. He's uh, getting his Ph.D., you have one. I'm a straight C student, so you guys are way above. <laughs> I, I think straight C would be generous. Uh, yeah, what I've, what I've seen, yeah. You guys are way above my pay grade, but uh, your PhD is in semiconductor device physics. That's correct. Yeah. What does that mean? I so yeah, so things. I mean, a semiconductor is uh, is what all the chips are made of for computers, right? And mm-hmm. so um, you're looking at uh, transistors, things like that, right? So it's it's really microelectronics. Um, those are layered structures that they grow. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, I did that out of grad school for a little bit, and then uh, I'm at Lockheed Martin yeah. and work there. So, so not related to that anymore. But, not related uh, to that. So, just doing some good technical work and and. Uh, so, semiconductor device physics, working at Lockheed Mark Martin. How does that translate to catching salmon? Well, you know, to me, right, I've always been a thinker. And so, you know, I started fishing young. I started fishing for trout and salmon on the Finger Lakes when I was probably 12. I had a boat when I was 12. Um, my grandmother used to drive me to the boat launch, and we'd launch the boat, and she'd do uh, crochet. She'd crochet, and I'd go fish for a few hours. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Uh, so, you know, I fished all my life, and um, so to me, what it what it comes down to is when I'm fishing, uh, I want to take as much data as I can get my hands on, and then I want to start looking at variables that I need to optimize when I'm out there fishing. Um, and so, you know, for me, the fish hawk is, is, is integral to what we do. Um, that's, that's as important to me as any other on water data that I'm getting, whether it's for my electronics or, or otherwise. Where's, where's your boat set? Where are you typically? Fish? Yeah. So I fish, I got two, two, two slips. I fish out of Oswego and I fish out of Sodus. Okay. Um, nominally out of Oswego, but we do keep a slip in Sodus. We, if the fishing's tough, sometimes I like to be able to bounce back to the West mm-hmm. just a little bit. Um, and where I live, I'm 35 minutes from Oswego and 50 minutes from Sodus. So, um, yeah, but nominally we're out of Oswego. So it's interesting though that you got you start the finger lakes. It's funny walking around this building because a lot of the more accomplished anglers I talked to in here, they did the same thing you did. As youngsters, they were out in small boats out on the finger lakes, you know, learning and cutting their teeth there. How how is fishing there in the finger lakes? How does that similar to what you would do on Lake? Yeah, Ontario? so back in the day, right as a kid, so there was a company in Naples, New York, Sutton Company. They built little flutter spoons they've been in business forever right and so there it's primarily a lake trout fishery um but as a kid really tr- you know trying to employ some of the some of the tactics that they were using on the great lakes really i remember i had a small crank down rigger i had on a boat um you know and it was it was it was trying to do that kind of stuff guys down there would pull copper so they would have copper spools on a on a reel and they would let that copper out and and yank it with, yeah. with these spoons and so um, learned kind of at an early age that to me, uh, when I was fishing that, that, you know, how important it was to, to have, I noticed that my catch rates were good when certain things were right with the boat, mm-hmm. right? Whether it was the direction I was going or the speed I was going, of course, you didn't have anything back then for, you didn't have any GPS or you didn't have anything, right? It was just this feel that you kind of developed. And so I think over time that feel develops in you the more you fish and it just becomes instinctual and so you you kind of fish in that way yeah you watch the angle of the lines no is that a movie no the, no. the, the, the line oh, no, angle the of the lines, angle of the lines. Angle of lines. <laughs> yeah the angle of lines we would watch lord of the rings or something. Right. yeah, yeah. 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 So the funny thing yeah. is i don't watch any movies yeah. I don't, okay. i've watched a handful of movies my entire life so <laughs> uh sometimes i'm like is that a movie <laughs> um yeah, so the angle of the lines you'd watch, um, you know, and just, just trying to figure it out, you know, and it wasn't, you know, the electronics were non-existent. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember even when I was in my 20s getting a small hummingbird unit to mount on a small boat that that had, you know, the, the, the little fish symbols. On yeah, it, right, or, yeah, yeah, or even yeah, before yeah. that, the, the mm-hmm. fish showed up just as like three or four pixels. Yeah, you know right. I mean, it was really yeah. terrible Yeah, compared to what we have now, yeah. you know. Yeah, I had I had one of those too. I think everybody yeah. did. Yeah. <laughs> or there that was a big deal when they had one that marked it in red, you know, right. just because right. it's a different color. But you'd see the big fish on there and get really excited. Yeah. Oh, there's a big one. I, I think the you know, for me personally, and one of the things that, you know, when you do this every day, one of the things that I think is exciting or, or is exciting to me is is guys like you, Rob, Ali Shakur, 
the intersection of science and sport, right? The intersection of science, the fishing, uh, because I mean, you, you talk to, you know, Vince was just, and you know, Vince, well, yeah. you know, I mean, you talk to guys like that. I mean, you know, the way they approach it, whether they call it science or not, it is, it's the same, right. it's the scientific process, right? right? So it doesn't matter what the discipline is, if it's limnology or semiconductors or whatever, that the scientific process is a, like a thread that runs throughout all these things. So you talk, you know, we, over the last four days here, we've talked to some fantastic anglers, right? And, and they all fish differently, but that thread runs through the whole, you know, it's the same, they all use the same process or right. a very similar process, even though they might do things way different or yeah. fish different places or. Yeah. They may not realize maybe the why behind it, but they know they to know, do it yeah. and to figure it out. Yeah. Right. So we yeah. had that experience that, that, you know, I'm, yeah, I, I just think that's so huge. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, we're fortunate to do with traveling around different parts of the country is we see that in different places where it doesn't matter if it's in New York or Oregon, you know, I mean, it's the same, right. Same thing. So. It's yeah. a process of learning and it's something that, you know, like we had Lance on, Lance has got his eight steps and yeah. really what that is, is it's a scientific process. It'd be just like what you would do in your job when you're trying to figure out if something's going to work or not. Yeah. You start here and okay, that's works at that point. And then we're, we're just moving down the line. Just creating a process, I, right? I'm kind of nerding out here, but that's, I mean, it's, that's what it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's what it, right. I mean, you just see that and it's like, it's not a coincidence. So how do the fish react to those, those things? And, and not necessarily the, the black box and what that does or, or the optimum and that, that ion charge, but how do they react to the stray stuff that you're trying to eliminate? Well, so typically I think they would avoid the stray stuff, right? And so I'm pretty neurotic about things in general. Um, you know, when I got my, the boat I've got now, um, you know, I check all the grounds. I make sure I don't have any resistance between my grounds and my bonding system in the boat. Um, you know, all those things can contribute. And so, um, that's something that I, that, you know, that I'm, that I'm pretty, that I do believe in. And, um, and I do believe that running, you know, that running the, the positive ion or a black box, um, really helps. I know sometimes if you've got Kings laying on the bottom, uh, like when they're staging up, you can jack up that voltage a little bit, especially when you're really trying to to stir those fish up. You're running real big paddles to try and uh, just to try and get an aggression strike out of there. It does seem that if you if you dial that voltage up a little bit, they will come off the bottom a little bit more. I don't know what it what it necessarily does to them physiologically, but it definitely has an impact. You, you can take a multimeter to an aluminum boat. You can take a multimeter and pull voltage right yeah, off. Yeah, I guarantee yeah. you. Can. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you wanted to... And that voltage is just coming off your electronics, you know, through the wires, is coming through the insulation of the wires, or that, how does that, where does that come from? Um, so, it's usually not going to be a huge voltage, it's going to be a small voltage. Es essentially, that boat acts like a cell of a battery, mm -hmm. and so you've got a ground, and, and it's no different than when you're at a marina and you've got a bunch of boats hooked up to shore power. Um, there you're hooked up to shore power. If your boat's out in the water, you've got, you know, you're running, you're generating, uh, you're generating power through either your DC, uh, you know, you you've got your DC battery, you've got an alternator that's charging stuff. So you've got a lot of, a lot of areas where you could get a little bit of a voltage leak. Um, and so, yeah. And again, more of a saltwater thing, but you can actually get it just through electrolysis too. You, can. you know, yeah. the actual, uh, you know, aluminum boat and saltwater will actually produce electrolyte. I mean, yeah. Again, small. I mean, we're not talking crazy voltage here, but yeah, half it's, a me it's, me it's yeah, measurable. It's measurable. Yeah. So we've been getting really nerdy here for the last four or five minutes. Mm, I, I like it. <laughs> right. I like it. Let's talk about fishing, Rob. Yeah. What do you like so to, do, to do, uh, do when you go fishing? Yeah. So we, uh, you know, we fish on the east end of Lake Ontario a lot. We don't have kings typically until July, early or not. I'll say not fishable numbers most years. Some years we do, um, but we do a lot of brown trout fishing early on. Um, we love our brown trout, so we fish them a lot. Um, you know, when I'm going out to fish browns, you know, in the in the in the spring or in the summer, um, the big thing that I use the fish hawk for uh, springtime not necessarily as much. There's not a lot of currents. You're in tight, um, but you know, I like the temperature aspect of it. Uh, where it really shines to me is is when you're fishing that that late late spring into summer or even really midsummer brown trout fishing. Um, we even fish browns when there's kings around sometimes. My kid loves them. It's hard to peel them away from them, call them as pets. Uh, 
So, you know, to me, when we go out and we're going to brown trout fish, I'm looking for a specific temperature of water or, you know, they're very, a very temperature tolerant fish. So I'm looking, if I've got a lot of really warm water that's pushed in, I'm going to go out and check water with my probe. So I'm going to go out, I'm not even going to fish yet. I'm going to go out and I'm going to put that probe down and I'm going to see what the temp profile looks like down to the bottom and some of my suspected brown trout areas that I like to fish. Um, and what I like to see is I don't, I don't care so much about how warm it is uh, on top, but I like to see a thin layer of water on the bottom that's maybe, you know, 58 degrees, 56 degrees. Those browns will lay down in that. When they want to, they'll lay down in that. They're comfortable in that water, but they'll come up into that really warm water too and feed, and you'll get them up into 70, 60, 69, 71 degree water all day long, um, especially the big ones. But um, so we use that a lot. The other thing with browns is they don't like a lot of current. Um, and so if I'm checking temps in the morning without any gear on and I'm, I'm just sitting in neutral checking temps um, and I'll put that probe right on the bottom, you know, I'll lay it on the bottom just to see where that, if there's a thin layer of cold water underneath it. But um, if, I'm, if I'm reading three quarters of a mile an hour current just sitting there, I know it's going to be a tough day right away and I'm going to have to grind on them if we're going to fish for them. I don't mind grinding on them, but I, I just, I have that mentality right away that, okay, it's going to be, it's probably going to be a little tougher, especially when you got moving water. If you got a big south wind blowing and you've got layers of water, sometimes you'll notice every pass that temp starts moving up because that the, the water on top is getting pushed offshore. Um, you know, you got to adjust up every pass. Um, and then also up and out because those fish will move out as that warm water is blowing <laughs> offshore. Um, so for us, it's a, it's just a, it's just a, a tool that we absolutely use when we're out there. We're lost if we don't have it. You know do, what I mean? Do you think they don't like current or they don't like change? I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's probably change, but yeah. the current causes the change, I, right? I, so I just when want, I was moving water. It just makes it. It just really gets tough. Yeah, I, I fish in rivers and in yeah. tailwaters and stuff quite a bit. Where you know, you, you see them. You know warm water you see those those browns out and you know riffle water i mean fast right. fast water yeah they where will it's, where it's like streams too but yeah, yeah uh where it's just like i just wonder if it's yeah change or if it's that flux state right if it's yeah so you're scouting for cold and you're scouting for water that's moving slow not cold i mean i like to have that thin yeah. water underneath it yeah. i'm not fishing necessarily down there absolutely not fishing that but i like that water because i know they're going to be there right i'm fishing higher up so i'm probably fishing you know it depends i'm gonna look at i'm gonna look at where i'm marking them but i'm also going to correlate that with what temps i'm getting and then as things change through the day i'll use that information um but you know 60 you know 50 58 to 65 degrees is a pretty good where that's close to the bottom it doesn't have to intersect the bottom they'll lay in colder water they'll come up to feed but if i've got that temp and i'm brown trout fishing an area where i know there's browns like i'm pretty confident that we'll get them very good one of the things that you said in there was uh my kid likes browns so you have a son or a daughter i have a son bobby yeah. I call him uh, on the dock he's he's nicknamed brown trout bobby so brown trout bobby. Nice. he's won the <laughs> the youth lock uh derby i don't know for browns a few times now so he's uh but he he definitely he likes browns and he's really he, he dials them in he knows what he's doing he'll run the back of the boat for browns um he understands what to run under different conditions and things like that he? uh, he's 12 now but he's been doing it since he could walk pretty much little guy very nice so so in our neck of the woods, we have a lot of walleye willies. If yeah. your name's Willie and you like to fish, you're walleye, you're walleye willies. Gotcha. Yeah. So we got brown, brown trout, trout Bobby. <laughs> Bobby in your neck of the woods. Um, tell us about that, though. So that's something that we've been talking about actually here the last couple of days, is getting young people involved in trolling, yeah. specifically Great Lakes trolling. What kind of things did you do to kind of get him excited? Yeah, so, you know, we stay on our boat. We've got a 33-foot Tierra, so we'll stay right on the boat. For me, the big thing was when he was little was not to push it, mm -hmm. right? If if we're out there fishing Fail. and he's hungry, <laughs> right? It's nine o'clock. <laughs> Captain Krabby. He's Captain Krabby. I, I, I push him too hard, so like now, yeah, okay, I, I want to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so I just I didn't push it, but he developed a love for it. Really, I mean, he just he did. He he took to it, um, and he just likes boats. He likes being out there. He knows all the guys. He. You know, he knows, he, he knows every boat on the water, who it is. You know, he talks to him. He, he's even texting a lot of those guys on his phone when I'm working the back of the boat. But 
um, he really enjoys it. Uh, likes salmon fishing, likes brown trout fishing. Um, we did a lot of brown trout fishing early when he was littler, just because it was easier for him. Those fish are easier. You know, I couldn't at seven years old put a king on a diver rod in his hand, right? So, um, but now he's old enough and big enough that he absolutely um, he he does the king stuff just fine. So, so I think it's just a slow progression to getting those kids into it. You know what I mean? Make it fun. You know what I mean? I'm sure there's days where I I get crabby on the boat too when things aren't going well. Yeah, I'm sure I, that that that, yeah. that you know, but but yeah. you know, you just got to make it fun. Very good, Rob. Yeah. We appreciate you coming yeah. on, man. It was fun having you. Yeah, I appreciate you guys yeah. for sure. Uh, enjoy it. Yeah. And, uh, take care. All right. Thank All right. you. Thanks, Rob.